Yes, hello everybody. So wonderful that we can discuss a little bit on sex differences in hypertension. I am Eva Gertz, Professor of Cardiology at the University of Bergen in Norway. And together with me here is Professor Isabella Sudano from Zurich in Switzerland. And our guest tonight is Professor Juan Tamargo from University of Madrid. And uh, recently there have been several publications about sex differences in hypertension. And uh, in particular also about pharmacological treatment. So tell me, Joan, how did you become interested in this field? Well, uh, it was very simple. And uh, sometimes people say this, uh, we cannot accept your explanation. It was very simple. I realized that when I move into the literature or in the pharmacology texts, uh, you could not see a single word about women. It was people with hypertension. Then you move into the, into the different trials and you find that many of them, uh, less than 35% of the population, recruited population were women. Nevertheless, they uh, gave recommendations for both men and women, even when most of the studies were not powered to answer the question if there is a difference, sexual difference between men and women in uh, threshold for treated hypertension or about the efficacy and safety of antihypertensive drugs. And particularly, I cannot accept that there are no differences because there are marked differences in adverse events. And if we have differences in adverse events, and adverse events are more common in women, this means that the adherence will be reduced. And if it's reduced, the control of hypertension will be hampered in women as compared to men. Thank you so much. So I think we can start with one of the most common questions we receive when we are talking about sex difference in hypertension. Are there difference in effect of antihypertensive treatment between men and women? Uh, well, if, if we look at the guidelines, both the European Society of Cardiology and the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association guidelines, they know that there are no convinced evidence uh, that different antihypertensive drugs, classes exerted sex-related differences in blood pressure lowering or provide distinct cardiovascular protection. Nevertheless, if now we look at the evidence where all this information was, where all the trials that, that lead to this uh, recommendation from the guidelines, the first we must see, is, as I already mentioned, is that many studies women were underrepresented. If I look at the spring trial, 36%. It was planned 50%, only 36%, okay? And, and therefore, many of the studies were not powered to determine sex-related difference. And second, I think this is a critical point, that there are only a few clinical trials have reported sex as, uh, results stratified by sex or perform sex-specific analysis of cardiovascular outcomes. So uh, what the people usually does is uh, I'm going to perform a subgroup analysis or post-hoc analysis. And both, both uh, a post-hoc or a subgroup analysis cannot be accepted as real solid evidence to answer the question if there are differences or not between men and women. And finally, even when the, the guidelines said, no, there are no differences, uh, I have several trials that found differences, significant difference between men and women. Uh, the live uh, study uh, enrolling uh, people, patients with hypertension and left ventricular hypertrophy, losartan was significantly more effective to reduce the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, stroke, myocardial infarction, uh, total mortality and onset of diabetes in women, but not in men. In the value trial, amlodipine was most eff more effective than uh, balsartan to reduce cardiovascular mortality and morbidity in women, but not in men. They all had, the final conclusion is there are no difference between men and women, but lysinopril was less effective in preventing a stroke than either chlorotalidone or amlodipine in women, but not in men. 
And the whole study also found that there was a reduction of myocardial infarction in, in women with the lowest uh, threshold for uh, systolic blood pressure, but this does not happen in men. And finally, and this is the most important one, the SPRINT trial demonstrate that there is a significant reduction in the primary outcome in men, but not in women. Despite this trial was designed to answer which was the threshold for, for, for treatment of hypertension. This trial cannot answer the question because women did not uh, get a benefit. Yes, thank you very much for all this information uh, on efficacy and I quite share your view. Uh, but many uh, physician colleagues are more interested in uh, sex differences inside effects than actually the lack of, uh, uh, of a demonstration of uh, benefit from, uh, from antihypertensive treatment in, uh, in the clinical trials. Uh, so... Uh, Women, in, at least in my experience, more often report side effects from diuretic treatment, from beta blocker treatment and ACE inhibitor treatment. So why is it so that women report more uh, side effects or adverse events during uh, treatment for the blood pressure? Thank you. Oh, well, there are several reasons. I think that probably the most important one is that we administer the same doses men to women. And we forgot that women have a smaller uh, uh, weight, body size, uh, the, the metabolism is different because the expression and activity of uh, cytochrome P450, C384 uh, uh, and 2D6 that are responsible for the biotransformation of approximately 60% of cardiovascular drugs that we uh, prescribe daily in our office, uh, the activity is reduced. And finally, uh, women, they have a reduction in renal blood flow, in glomerular filtration rate, and in the function of the uh, excretion mechanisms. As a consequence of all these, these effects, uh, the result is that if we prescribe the same dose a man and a woman, uh, the exposure of the antihypertensive drug will be much higher in men, in women than in men, and as a consequence, will be a dose-dependent increase in the risk of adverse events. That, for me, this is the most important reason. Why? Because with some compounds, for instance, amlodipine, it was initially described that there was a different exposure between men and women, but when the dose was adjusted to body weight, these differences disappear. So it's very important to remember that uh, there are differences in the maximum peak plasma levels and in the area under the curve of the different compounds between men and women. And this, this, this difference can be markedly reduced if we consider body weight and particularly, particularly glomerular filtration rate. So if you, we adjust the dose to body weight and uh, glomerular filtration rate, many of the differences between men and women can disappear. There's a second problem that can explain why adverse events are more frequent in women, is that usually women receive more drugs and send more comorbidities. This means if they have more drugs, it's polypharmacy, and the polypharmacy correlates with the, uh, with the comorbidities. And as a result, if women receive more drugs, it's not a surprise that they can develop more adverse drug reactions and more drug drug interactions. And finally, no doubt, there are differences uh, between men and women related with sex hormones. And this can explain uh, differences in the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics, and as a consequence, that there also are differences in the risk of uh, adverse drugs events. If I look particularly to all the compounds that we prescribe in patients with hypertension, adverse events are significantly more frequent in women than in men, with one exception, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. With these compounds, particularly with spironolactone and pleronone, it has been described that adverse events are more frequent in men than in women. 
Thank you so much. And there are some register and some study that show that uh, there is a difference, a sex difference in prescribing antihypertensive drug. Some studies show that uh, in women, more diuretical uh, drugs are prescribed, and in men, the first choice is usually an ACE inhibitor. Is really irrational to do this, or there is a, another explanation for this difference? I must say this is not rational. I don't want to say it's an irrational decision, but nevertheless, there are many trials that they reach the same conclusion. In patients, in women with, uh, with hypertension or with heart failure also, we found that they receive more diuretics uh, while men receive more ACE inhibitors. Uh, they receive more calcium channel blockers uh, and even sometimes more beta blockers. Uh, my, my, the only explanation I have is first, uh, the old heart trial, which found that an ACE inhibitor, lisinopril, and a calcium channel blocker and lodipine were inferior for controlling high blood pressure and lowering the risk of cardiovascular diseases compared with a diazide diuretic. Remember, in that case was protalino. So the, the, there was a there, there was some there was some inertia that, that from this study on uh, onwards to now that uh, diuretics are excellent. They are, they are, and uh, the, this trial demonstrate that the, the old compounds, because we cannot forget that diuretics were the, are the cornerstone of the treatment of hypertension since the, the, the 60s, you know, are better and better tolerated, more efficacious, more, more efficacious and better tolerated than the new compounds, ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers. The second reason is that the diuretics uh, thiazides can be combined with other antihypertensive and they produce at least an, an, an additive uh, effect. The third reason is that, um, for me, is that diuretics uh, are the first choice drug in postmenopausal women with comorbidities, uh, say hair failure, and including hair failure with not only reduced, but also preserved ejection fraction, with a stroke, transient ischemic attack, liver ventricular hypertrophy, uh, obesity, diabetes, peripheral artery disease, and so on. And finally, I already mentioned postmenopausal women and uh, thiazides have some interesting properties in, in uh, postmenopausal women and is that they reduce urinary calcium excretion and have a positive effect on the prevention of bone loss and uh, osteoporosis. And has it has been uh, reported that they can reduce the risk of uh, hip, for instance, uh, and other fractures. So they, they are... In, in diuretics are no doubt a first choice option in postmenopausal women. So all these reasons I gave to you four or five different uh, explanations can explain why, why. But uh, do uh, if you ask me if I agree with this uh, the, with the uh, the, the uh, so wide prescription of diuretics in women, the answer is no, because I think that for many women we have other compounds that can be more effective. Uh, and I mentioned that they are first choice in obesity or in diabetes, but no doubt for instance for me in patients with diabetes, it's quite clear that this inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker for me are first choice. Uh, you highlighted uh, that uh, you think that uh, the dosage that give the optimal effect in women might be lower also in antihypertensive treatment. But uh, uh, I'm only aware of this uh, uh, post hoc analysis uh, in heart failure patients where the outcome was actually uh, death or major cardiovascular events. And they looked particularly into uh, ACE inhibitor uh, dosage and also beta blocker dosage. And they found that about half of the dosage 
was the uh, gave, gave the same effect in women compared to men. But are you aware of similar analysis uh, when it comes to hypertension? Because we know that the blood pressure is much more difficult to control, particularly in uh, older women than in men. So, uh, so what is the evidence that we have that we could uh, could be more successful on the side uh, effect? Uh, uh, side effect uh, side, but uh, but we also need to have g good control of the blood pressure. So, so what do you know about uh, the evidence in in uh, in this? Okay. Thank you for this question because I, I, I was thinking 1999, okay, almost 23 years ago. Lucia and co-workers demonstrate that um, uh, they compare a propranolol and metoprolol. I'm going to refer only to metoprolol because propranol is seldom used in treatment hypertension. Uh, they found at that time that uh, the drug exposure of those, those these two compounds, propranol and metoprolol, were 50 to 90 percent higher in women than in men. The reason was that there were uh, there was a significant increase in the drug absorption and therefore in drug viability. And there was a reduction in the biotransformation of these compounds. There are several papers that demonstrate that uh, this higher exposure to metoprolol is translated into a greater decrease in blood pressure and in heart rate in women than in men. There is one paper published this year from France that demonstrate very beautifully that when we increase the plasma concentration of metoprolol, there is a decrease in heart rate and blood pressure in women, but the correlation was flat in men. There is also evidence that in patients with uh, resistant hypertension, this paper was published almost 25, 20 years ago, if you administer uh, metoprolol, uh, the reduction in blood pressure in women was significantly better, uh, more marked than in men. There was also from Eugene, this was, I must say that this was a pharmacokinetic uh, model. And what he did was to compare the dose he needed to administer to a young man or a young woman and to reach the same area under the curve. This means the same exposure. What he found was the following. He calculated that a 50 milligram dose in an adult woman provides an approximately similar metoprolol drug exposure to 100 milligrams dose in adult men. So, Lucier in 1999, Eugene in 2016, and some other authors proposed that in women, we need to reduce the dose of metoprolol by 50%. There is also evidence that the uh, exposure to nifedipine and verapamil are different in women and men. And what we know is that the, the exposure is lower in women. But if we compare young women with older women, we realize that there was an increase in the exposure to uh, verapamil in older women. So this means that older women respond uh, better than a younger woman, reduce, even if we reduce the dose. So we have experience with metoprolol, with propranolol, with nifedipine, uh, with uh, rapamil, and you already mentioned the data that Santema and co-workers published in, in, in The Lancet in 2019. This is interesting because they, they have a European study and they obtain a replication of the data in an Asian uh, another Asian study. And what they found is very nice because they found that they, I must say, patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. A 30% risk reduction in all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalization can be obtained with approximately 50% of the approved dose for AC inhibitors, tensin receptor blockers, and beta blockers. And no further benefit is obtained if we increase the dose. While in men, the largest risk reduction was obtained with 100% of the 
of the recommended dose. So it's another evidence that men and women probably need different doses. My question is very simple. Who is going to support the studies to determine which is the real dose for men and women with compounds that at the present time are cheap genetics? Nobody is going to fund this. So the only way to answer this question, different doses in men and women, is that a big society, the European Society of Cardiology, gave support, financial support, to answer these questions. Because we have the evidence. And if we do not change the doses in women, women will be overexposed to these compounds. And as a consequence, they will have more adverse events. As a consequence of their more their increasing adverse events, they did not uh, follow the treatment. If they do not follow the treatment, we are lost because we never will control uh, hypertension in women, particularly in elderly women. And elderly women have the greatest problem simply because with age, the, uh, there is a, I must say, quarter marks, uh, impairment, physiological impairment in metabolic uh, clearance and in renal clearance. And therefore, as a consequence, the, 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 the blood pressure, the, the blood levels of the, all these compounds will increase. And once again, we need to reduce the dose, and particularly in elderly women. No doubt. From a pharmacological point of view, and with all this, this reference I offered to you, there's no, no, no doubt that with, with these compounds, we need to identify the good dose, the proper dose. If we reduce the dose and we maintain the same efficacy, we will reduce the incidence of adverse events. So fantastic. The same efficacy uh, with, 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 with less adverse events. But once again, who is going to support, who is, who is going to, to pay for the, these studies with cheap, uh, non-competitive genetics? I don't know how to answer. But I just tried to, to push to the European Society of Cardiology to support this type of study because they are important for the general population. They are important for the society and they are important for the health systems and health costs. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with you. But, uh, but I think also to start to talk about this subject, I think that is also a start to make people aware about this, because I quite agree with you. This information is hidden, and uh, not only for the general practitioners that usually see the patients that we talk about with high blood pressure, but also for many specialists, that it, that it is unknown that these different uh, differences are real and uh, have a, a uh, uh, biological uh, uh, underlying course, and also that we we need documentation to kn to know what the optimal treatment is. So over to you, yeah. Isabella. Thank you, Eva. I think we had a, a incredible, interesting discussion, which will be the base for further discussion and hopefully for for the study, because. Even if the guideline says us, okay, treat men and women same way, same target, same drug, it's, it's known that sex specific analyses are quite scarce. And I think just talking about this and think so, plan study where this aspect should be evaluated is already a step forward. And then I think what I will take with me is, of course, uh, the dose, a question to correct this for body weight, for a glomerular filtration rate, and with the same body weight, with the same glomerular filtration rate, maybe to consider that the dose should be different according to sex in this case. And last but not least, uh, I think uh, the planning uh, for the study, for new study, it will be for sure a very important future aim 
of the ESC and of the ESC Council of Arts Extension, at least I hope so. So I really thank you, Professor Tamargo, for the incredible amount of information that we shared with you. Thank you, Eva, and thank you to everyone who were listening. Have a very nice evening.